West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com of this town was the work of this one crooked police officer who himself had been charged with theft and abuse, who would go on, in fact, to be convicted of perjury. That young civil rights attorney who went to Tulia, Texas in the wake of all these convictions, who went through all of the cases and realized that they were all built on nothing, who personally lined up lawyers from all around the country to for more than 30 defendants who didn't have any defense counsel, whose appeals had already been rejected, who acted as lead counsel herself for the NAACP in all those defendants' cases as they pried this thing open, who got the crooked cop to break down and melt down on the stand in March 2003, which did break open the case, and all the convictions were overturned, and all the prisoners were freed. And in August 2003, Texas Republican Governor Rick Perry issued a full and complete pardon for all of those poor people. That young civil rights attorney who exposed what happened there, who made that happen, her name is Vanita Gupta. That lawyer, Vanita Gupta, went on to become the head of the Civil Rights Division at the U.S. Justice Department under President Obama. Widely respected in that role, she served in that very high-profile job without any whiff of scandal or trouble. President Biden has since nominated her to be the number three official in the whole Justice Department, Assistant Attorney General. In that nomination, she has, among other things, the support of every major law enforcement organization in the country, including the Fraternal Order of Police, which is the police union organization that twice endorsed Donald Trump. Even they support Vanita Gupta. Vanita Gupta is one of the senior Justice Department officials who is not confirmed in this administration because Republicans are not only blocking her nomination, they are slow walking it through the Senate. They're trying to trip it up, trying to keep her from being confirmed. And here's the thing. Here's why this is all worth knowing. Ready? Who do you think is the Republican senator who is leading the charge against Vanita Gupta and has stopped her from being confirmed thus far? So Merrick Garland doesn't have any of his top people there with him at the Justice Department. Vanita Gupta is going to be the number three official of the Justice Department. She's not there yet. Why is that? Well, there's a Republican senator taking point on this, leading the charge to try to keep her from being confirmed. Who is that? It's a senator from Texas. Senator from Texas, who used to be Attorney General of the state of Texas. It's Texas Senator John Cornyn, who, when he was Attorney General of the state of Texas, is the guy who gave Officer Tom Coleman the Texas Lawman of the Year Award for his great work in Tulia, Texas, before Vanita Gupta came in and exposed who that guy actually was, before he was convicted of perjury, before every single one of those cases was overturned because that guy made them all up. And they all got full pardons from Rick Perry because of the Kafka-esque nightmare and disaster that was that guy, who John Cornyn named Lawman of the Year. I wonder, I just wonder if Senator John Cornyn might be at all embarrassed about this and about the young lawyer 
who came to Texas and exposed this thing, this terrible and cartoonishly evil thing that he had helped along, that he had celebrated, that he had given an award to. It is now Senator John Cornyn leading the charge against Vanita Gupta to be the number three official at the U.S. Justice Department, even against all of those law enforcement organizations endorsing her. Judiciary Committee is due to vote on her nomination tomorrow. Republicans, led by John Cornyn, have been demanding that Vanita Gupta actually needs to come back and do her confirmation hearings over a second time. Uh, That is not going to happen tonight. We have obtained exclusively, I think, um, the reply letter um, from Democratic Judiciary Committee Chairman Senator Dick Durbin, uh, the reply to Senator, Republican senators demanding that she needs to do her confirmation all over again. Senator Durbin telling Republicans, no, they are not going to stop Vanita Gupta's nomination any longer. It says in part, quote, dear senators, while I always appreciate hearing from colleagues on the committee, your request to hold a second hearing on Vanita Gupta's nomination to be associate attorney general appears to be little more than a delay tactic aimed not at gathering more information, but at obstructing a highly qualified and historic nominee who's dedicated her career to the protection and expansion of civil rights. The committee will not hold a second hearing for Ms. Gupta, and her nomination will move forward with a committee vote. A second hearing on Gupta's nomination is unwarranted and unnecessary. The committee will vote on her nomination tomorrow. Sincerely, uh, Dick Durbin, committee chairman. Vanita Gupta is going to be confirmed by the Senate, ultimately. She will be the number three official at the U.S. Justice Department under Merrick Garland. And that is despite unified Republican opposition to her, led by the senator who she humiliated and exposed in Texas nearly 20 years ago for his enabling, encouraging, celebrating role in one of the worst, most racially explosive, astonishingly brazen law enforcement put-up jobs in the last generation. Senator Cornyn, I do not know if he's ashamed by his role in all that. I wonder if he ever tried to get the award back. But his effort to get revenge on the woman who had to come in and fix his mess, that effort will fail. She will win and he will lose again. God bless Texas. It is Thursday, the 25th of March of 2021. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Oh, wow. Well, uh, quite a story there at the top with Rachel. Uh, Now, the full report that she did was quite extensive. She gave a uh, backgrounder on this crooked cop and what happened in Tulia, Texas. Now, what happened in Tulia, Texas is that this one cop, an undercover cop, uh, purportedly, he was with a biker gang and he had a pot addiction, whatever that is. Anyway, uh, he went into this little town of Tulia, Texas. When I say little town, it's about 5,000 people. And proceeded to arrest 10% of the, of the population. 500 black people. On no evidence. He'd go to court and say, yep, they did it. And uh, people were sentenced to 99 years in one case. And they were all innocent. Just happened to be black. I don't know why. Maybe he wanted to pump up his uh, arrest uh, totals. Who knows? Maybe there was a bonus involved. Well, he did get an award. Lawman of the year. John Cornyn is there giving it to him, and they couldn't speak enough about this guy. In fact, it was another way to kick the libs. Evidence. We don't need evidence. That's for liberals. By the word of this cop, people went to prison. In one case for almost 100 years. No evidence. Now, after they were put in prison for, let's see, about four years, finally, the ACLU was able to get their case into court, and Vanita Gupta 
pleaded the case and won on every single incarceration from this crooked cop. And she exposed the crooked cop on the stand. And now John Cornyn is blocking her nomination to be third in line at the DOJ. Uh Uh-huh. Just don't call it identity politics, huh? (laughs) Yeah, identity politics. I, I, these, oh, God, they're so maddening. I got to say, the uh, maggots are now crawling out from under the woodwork, thinking that they can gaslight everybody. What a great president uh, Donald Trump was, how he was able to roll out the vaccine that was online, and how protected we were at the border. Yeah, we were protected from little six-year-olds coming here because their mom and dad are dead. And their country is being blown up, and we're not doing diddly about it. And I don't mean sending troops down there. I mean changing the market forces that cause these people to get blown up just for being there. You're in my way. I want that tree. So, yeah, we had to be protected from six- and seven-year-olds. We'll just put them on cold concrete. Let them get pneumonia, the flu, and die. And they did. There's no crisis at the border any greater than what was happening in 2017. Not that that was any great feat. But this is all sabotage. We got the guy in the DOJ effing up uh, the uh, prosecution on these insurgents. Oh yeah, they're going to get charged with sedition. What the F? You know, they went after an FBI agent. The number one guy in uh, uh, mob investigations because he and uh, Lisa Page had a little thing going on and uh, they didn't like Hillary. Well, I'm sorry. They didn't like Trump, but they didn't like Hillary either. But because they didn't like Trump, obviously they were prejudiced against Trump. Well, they didn't like Hillary either. But they got rid of that guy. Whoa. Uh Uh-huh. Why? Well, you know, for a number of reasons, the purported thing is that he spoke to the press. Let's not forget about the uh, former FBI. uh, There was a guy up there. Also, FBI assistant. I don't think he was a director. But regardless, I'm having a brain lock on who that was. But before Chris Ray. And they ran him out because apparently he spoke on a uh, background, which he was supposed to do. And he said that, oh, he, uh, he uh, divulged information that he shouldn't have been divulging to the press. Well, then what about this Sherwin guy going on to 60 Minutes? Basically undermining the prosecution against these insurgents. It is sabotage. And if it's sabotage, that means that Vlad is behind it, ultimately. And what repercussions will come to those who have been taking part in the active attacks against the United States and its government? And I'll, I got to say, even mucking around with our uh, power grid, you know, that's, that's people's lives there. Not to mention the lies that caused over a half a million people to be dead. Thanks very much. Well, John Cornyn, (laughs) gotta love Texas. He's going to get his comeuppance, and you know it. Now, of course, uh, that hearing started before we came on the air. But uh, I'm sorry. (laughs) You can always listen to the podcast. And uh, take in that hearing because I'm going to have to take it in also later on. And we'll see how it turns out. But uh, one John Cornyn, no wonder they have to gerrymander everywhere they go because that's the only way they can get a John Cornyn elected. Texas would be more uh, in the lines of voting for an Ann Richards than the current crop of, well, I don't know, what are they? I throw the Nazi term around too much. I'm not going to call them Nazis necessarily. But uh, I don't know. Big-headed Texans? No ranch. (laughs) Yeah, they're running it right now. And they know all. 
right down to the point where, you know, they, uh, uh, they're being questioned at this very moment or later on today, actually, about their actions in the power uh, snafu during a cold snap in which people died because they were gaming the market during a, a polar vortex. Yeah, well, Grandma Millie uh, freezes to death. F Grandma Millie. Echoes of Enron. <laughs> I think it's the same model. No one wants to talk about it, or very few do. But uh, Texas, a lot of a lot of stuff comes out of Texas, and I want to know, or maybe I don't want to know what that stuff is. It stinks, it really does. Well, what's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Two Oregon brothers are the first from the state to be arrested for their role in the Capitol insurrection. Uh huh. They're coming for you. That's right. Once again, uh, just uh, tagging the FBI on Twitter with at FBI. There's nobody sitting there taking notes. You got to call the tip line. If you know something, say something. I In this instance, you got to because these really are Nazis trying to take over our government and our lives. We can't allow it to happen. A federal judge dismissed an Ohio lawsuit for early redistricting data. That's right. They want to gerrymander before the census gives up the numbers. And the reason the census is delayed. Yeah. Sabotage by Trump and his administration. And after 100 years, the California condor could return to the Northwest just in time. After the break, we move to the chef's table where Chinese hackers used Facebook to target Uyghurs abroad. Facebook divulged that, too. I think <laughs> under duress, though. And the United Nations confirmed a published report that a Saudi official threatened the life of the independent Khashoggi investigator. All that and more. On West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Bon Appetit. netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln and I gotta tell you Kelly has a show uh, at the table happy hour on Saturdays check it out and she also Saturday night teams up with Ricky for the late night morning show so you gotta check it out thank you Kelly for everything that you do if you would then take a gander across the page Near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the left, you'll then notice the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could afford maybe how about the cost of an espresso type coffee drink, and if you could send those funds to us once a month, we're then able to pool that money with how, what we pull out of our own pockets, our own wallets, because we, you know, we, we do that. And uh, with those funds, we pay our bills, we fly under the radar, and we continue this progressive resistance broadcasting that we've been doing 24-7, 365 for the last 10 years. Happy birthday to us, 10 years! If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that and so much more. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam, and I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Codes about 10 minutes before showtime, and then I get that linked up on Twitter and other social media platforms, one that we usually don't like to mention, but it's there. Yeah, Rate a Babe site, one of those old Rate a Babe sites, he militarized it, and now look what's happened. Follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West. 
and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever fine podcasts can be found. Mixed in with all the rest of us, uh-huh. Oh, I've been meaning to to uh, mention um, William Shatner, 90 years old. Who knew? We're all getting so old. It's going to be weird. My best friend's dad uh, commented that, you know, all all of his friends, you know, were dead. All, all of his friends from high school, people he fought in World War II with, people from LAPD that he worked with there for 20 years. And then my, my best friend's dad took put in another, what, 25 years for L.A. County Sanitation as their superintendent. And so all of his friends and workers that he worked with there, they were all dead. And all the celebrities that he grew up, with you know they were you know the movie stars and the singers and the writers and just whatnot they were all dead too and uh because that's what happens isn't that weird life is so odd we only we're only here for a short amount of time and i guess we have choices to make in that short amount of time and a lot of those choices uh i think are really delineations between the good and the bad of how our world can be and is choices you either make a wise choice or you make an unwise choice and usually unwise choices are deadly not only to yourself but for life in general we ought to think about that i guess that's what's called empathy The responsibility to not hurt your fellow human beings. Or how about life in general? Yeah, wouldn't that be nice? Well, let's look into this first offering here. What? This is not a show on metaphysics. Well, it could be. As part of the uh, salon aspect of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. But this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes out of the Associated Press by apparently anonymous staff. Two brothers have been arrested in Oregon on federal charges of participating in the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, the FBI said yesterday, Wednesday. Matthew Matthew Klein, age 24, was arrested Tuesday in Sherwood, and his brother, 21-year-old Jonathan Peter Klein, was arrested the same day near Hapner. Both faced charges in U.S. District Court in the District of Columbia for their role in the Capitol breach. Those charges include conspiracy, obstruction of an official proceeding, obstruction of law enforcement during a civil disorder, destruction of government property, entering a restricted building, and disorderly conduct. The brothers made an initial court appearance in Portland and remain in custody since Tuesday's appearance. The case is being transferred to D.C. for further proceedings, the FBI said. The brothers are the first people in Oregon to be charged in relation to the riots at the U.S. Capitol, and I gotta say, they're not gonna be the last. Attempts to reach an attorney for the brothers were unsuccessful. Well, of course, they live outside the law. What do they need a lawyer for? Jonathan Peter Klein has described himself as a proud boy, which means he's got, carries a big gun, probably got a little pee pee. And was photographed on January 5th with his brother while wearing a Proud Boy PDX shirt. PDX is a common abbreviation for Portland, Oregon. Why? Because that's the name of the uh, airport terminal there. PDX. The photo helped law enforcement identify the brothers because, look, if you're a Proud Boy, that means that your brain is down in your pants, not up in your head. And uh, they were also captured on video the following day in the Capitol riots. More than 300 people have been charged in connection to the riot. Authorities said they believe at least 100 more could face charges.
Mike Schneider of the AP brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A federal judge yesterday, Wednesday, dismissed a lawsuit filed by the state of Ohio that tried to get the U.S. Census Bureau to provide data used for drawing congressional and legislative districts ahead of its planned release. U.S. District Judge Thomas Rose in Dayton, Ohio, rejected the state's request for a preliminary injunction that would have forced the Census Bureau to release the redistricting data by March 31st. Ohio filed its lawsuit last month after the Census Bureau said the data would would not be available until September, months after the redistricting deadlines for many states. Posing the first challenge to the Bureau's revised deadline on the data, the lawsuit said the delay will undermine Ohio's process of redrawing districts. Alabama also has filed suit over the changed deadline. The Bureau has since said the data will be available in an older format in August. In dismissing the suit, the judge said there was nothing that could be done to fix Ohio's redistricting quandary since it was impossible for the Census Bureau to meet the legally mandated March 31 deadline. Bureau officials said last month that they needed more time because of operational delays caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Operational delays... Yeah, the pandemic had something to do with it, indeed. But if it wasn't for the Trump administration mucking up all the works, oh, we want we want to change the Constitution and not count everybody. What? Now, in order to draw congressional districts, Ohio needs to know how many congressional seats it will get when the apportionment numbers are released and that data are not being released until next month, the judge said. So even if the relief Ohio seeks, uh, the data by March 31st was granted, Ohio would be no closer to drawing congressional districts on April 1st. You fool. Oh, I added that last part. The judge said Ohio could use other data to draw its districts. The state's claim that fights over what alternative data to use would undermine confidence in the redistricting process was speculative, Rose said. Accuracy would seem to be the foundation of confidence, and Ohio's uh, redistricting plan foresees the possibility of delays in providing numbers, the judge said. It would seem that the remedy Ohio seeks is more likely to reduce public confidence indeed. The delay in releasing the data has sent states scrambling to come up with alternative plans. Many will not get the data until after their legal deadlines for drawing new districts, requiring them to either rewrite laws or ask the courts to allow them a free pass because of the delay. Candidates may not know yet whether they will live in the district they want to run in by the filing deadline. And in some cases, if fights over new maps drag into the new year, Primary elections may have to be delayed. If you're trying to deconstruct the administrative state, this sounds like a pretty good way to do it. Press bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. The endangered California condor could return to the Pacific Northwest for the first time in 100 years. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service plans to allow the release 
of captive-bred giant vultures into the Redwood National Park as early as this fall to create a non-essential experimental population for California's far north, Oregon, and northwestern Nevada. The project will be headed by the Yurok tribe, which traditionally has considered the California condor a sacred animal, and has been working for years to return the species to the tribe's ancestral territory. Certainly within a year, we hope to have birds in the sky. Tiana williams Clausen, director of the Wildlife Department of the Yurok tribe, uh, said in a statement, not having him here for one, not having him here for 100 years now, we as a people are wounded without having that spirit flying in our sky, she said. The California condor is the largest native North American bird with a wingspan of nearly 10 feet. The scavenger was once widespread but had virtually disappeared by the 70s because of poaching, lead poisoning from eating animals killed by hunters, and destruction of his habitat. In the early 80s, all 22 condors remaining in the wild were trapped and brought into a captive breeding program and be, uh, that began releasing the giant vultures into Southern California's Los Padres National Forest in 1992. That flock has been expanding its range, while other condors n now occupy parts of California's Central Coast, Arizona, Utah, and Baja California, Mexico. The total wild population now numbers more than 300 birds. A dozen adults and two chicks died last summer when a wildfire ravaged their territory in Big Sur. The new initiative calls for releasing four or six juvenile condors each year for 20 years throughout the Redwood National Park, which is about an hour's drive from the Oregon border. Condors can live for 60 years and fly vast distances, which is why their range could extend into several states. Well, this is good news. And it's also time for us to get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, Long Live the Queen King. After directing television and documentaries, celebrated actor Regina King has made her feature film directorial debut, and what a debut it is. One Night in Miami is writer Kemp Power's adaptation of his award-winning play, a fictional account of a real-life 1964 meeting between, get this, Sam Cooke, Jim Brown, Muhammad Ali, and Malcolm X. It's the evening after Ali beats Sonny Liston to become the heavyweight champ, when Brown is starting his acting career, and when Malcolm X is planning his Hajj to Mecca and his departure from the Nation of Islam. And if all that means nothing to you, then this movie may not be your jam. Zone out for the next minute and a half. Oh, and by the way, black movies matter. This film sees King not only as a director who can work with actors, but also as a director who benefits from her sensibilities as an actor. First, she trusted Powers and his script. As such, the heart of the film is built from three long scenes in one location each, with pretty much just the four principles. That means it's acting time. No effects, no quick moments, or action sequences, nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. You just have to be right with your characters, and what characters they are. I was surprised at just how accessible these giants were. Eli Gorey, my man Aldous Hodge, Kingsley Benadir, and Leslie Odom Jr., who has snagged two Oscar nominations from this flick, gently stepped these figures down from their pedestals without sacrificing their greatness. And though I was thrown at first, I grew to appreciate peeking into a private space where these men could both hold themselves up and hold each other to account as their greater civic stakes entwined with their personal ones. That accessibility is all due to King, who challenged her actors to find the vulnerability in these now near-mythic figures. Says King, One Night in Miami is quote, a quiet film, but it's loud as far as the subject matter. And in her hands, that combination proves to be moving and powerful. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This 
This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Sarah Vitek. Someone who knows how can pick a lock using just a paperclip. But how about with a smartphone? Researchers at the National University of Singapore wondered if smartphone audio of a key turning inside a lock could be used to figure out the shape of that key. And, spoiler alert, under the right conditions, they could create a few very good candidate keys, including the correct key. Sandaria Ramesh, a grad student who led the work on the project, which the researchers called Spy Key, said that the work was inspired by some previous research where the movement of smartwatches on people's wrists was used to figure out the code of combination locks. Essentially, what they did was they were looking at smartwatches on your wrist in order to infer the, the pin to the combination lock. So in some sense, they're able to measure the, the angle, right? So we were like, okay, wait, people are doing this for combination locks. Maybe like there are some you know similar insights that we can apply to other kinds of locks. And the most prevalent kind of locks is these um, kind of physical locks and keys. The first task for the team was to get audio from a key opening a lock and to see if they could pull useful information out of that audio. Whenever you insert a key into a lock, it produces a series of click sounds. The pins of the lock moving over the ridges of the key is what produces the clicks. Which is not really um, audible for the human ear because it's too close to be resolvable. But when you hear it from a high quality microphone, you can actually clearly hear these click sounds. Once they verified that getting this series of clicks out of the audio was possible, they moved on to using simulations. And that's because for the type of lock that they chose, the quote-unquote key space, or the number of possible unique keys, was 586,584. And they wanted to test how this type of analysis would work on every possible key. So instead of getting actual audio for 586,000 keys, they just simulated where the clicks would be in those audio recordings. Spikey was like the best case analysis for an attacker. So if he manages to get all the click information precisely, then this is how the results would be. Using the time between each click and some clever geometry, the researchers attempted to figure out the shape of each key. Immediately, about half of the possible keys were deemed unattackable. And that's because some of the clicks that those keys would produce would overlap with each other. This left about 330,000 potential key shapes. More analysis was able to narrow down each sound signature to just a handful of key patterns. The research was presented at ACM's Hot Mobile 2020, which is a computer science research conference. The strategy is a long way from being viable in the real world. For one thing, it relies on the key being inserted at a constant speed. And for another, the audio element has a lot of challenges, like background noise. The main point of this work was not really to say, you know, like, stop using these keys because they're not really good. It's more about, like, just being aware of what keys we're using, what locks we're using. So I think being aware of what is actually on your front door is very important. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Sarah Vitak. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. As the days get longer and the weather warms, people of all ages will start to spring into action. Spring is a great time to breathe fresh air, stretch your arms and legs, and get physically active outdoors. Lack of physical activity contributes to obesity, heart disease, stroke, and other chronic health conditions. Fortunately, many communities are making it easier and safer to be physically active. Neighborhoods across the country are working together to create more public spaces for walking, running, biking, and other physical activities. Adults should get at least 150 minutes of physical activity each week, and children should get 60 minutes a day. If you find it hard to walk to a local recreation center, park, or playground, Learn how to make your neighborhood a place that makes healthy living easier. Visit makinghealthesier.org for information about ways communities can change to get more people outside and moving. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. 
This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Nemhauser, filling in for your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. As the U.S. population ages, more people are at risk for injuries. The largest percentage of injury-related deaths among this group are caused by falls. Elizabeth Burns is with CDC's National Center for Injury Prevention and Control. She's joining us today to discuss ways to prevent injuries and deaths from falls among senior adults. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Elizabeth, what are some of the more common consequences when a senior adult falls? Well, first, it's important to note that falls are incredibly common. More than one in four older adults will fall in a given year. Common consequences include loss of independence and an increased fear of falling, as older adults are afraid to do the same kinds of activities they were doing before. And this can actually lead to more falls, as older adults have less strength than their lower body. Common consequences include hip fracture and traumatic brain injury. And ultimately, in 2016, almost 30,000 older adults died because of a fall. So are falls more common in men or in women? Falls are more common in women, and more women go to the emergency department because of a fall, and more women die because of a fall. However, the rate of fall deaths are more common in men than women. What this means is that out of 100,000 men, more will die from a fall than out of 100,000 women. What are common causes of falls among older people? Getting on and off the toilet and getting in and out of bed are common causes of falls. Walking around the hallways at night when the lights are off is a common way people fall. There's also an increased amount of medications used in seniors, which have side effects like making them lightheaded, and that increases the risk of falls and is a common cause. With all of those factors, what are some ways our listeners can decrease their chances of falling? Older adults should talk to their health care provider or doctor about how they can decrease their chances of falling. This can be done during the annual wellness visit or during annual physicals. The doctor will recommend an exercise program that should increase strength and balance or maybe refer you to a physical therapist. Additionally, they can look through your medications and perhaps reduce your doses or suggest medications that decrease your chances of falls. Are there things we can do to modify our homes to prevent falling? Oh, absolutely. Installing grab bars on the side of the toilet, making sure that rugs are taped down or removed, making sure that there's lighting in the hallways are all really simple ways that an older adult can modify their home to prevent falls. Where can listeners go to get more information about preventing falls? Listeners can go to cdc.gov slash study, and that's spelled S-T-E-A-D-I. Thanks, Elizabeth. I've been talking today with Elizabeth Burns about ways to prevent fall-related injuries and deaths among senior adults. Improving strength and agility through regular exercise and removing potential obstacles in the home can help decrease the risk for falls. If you or a loved one is older and struggle with mobility, talk with a health care provider about ways to decrease the risks for fall-related injuries and death. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Jeffrey Nemhauser for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. Netrootsradio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. The proposed United States Citizenship Act of 2021 introduced in the House and Senate in February would create a path to citizenship for most of the 11 million people living in the United States who don't have documents. 
Soy Javier Luengo Garrido, organizador de la ACLU de Massachusetts, y este es el Minuto de Libertades Civiles con el abogado de ACLU, Bill Newman. The proposed process would not be a simple or guaranteed one, and for most people, it would take eight years. An individual would apply for temporary legal status, which would require passing a criminal and national security check and proof that they paid all their taxes. After that, they'd have to live and work in the country for five years, after which, if all is in order, they could apply for a green card. Then, after three more years, if they pass additional background checks, demonstrate proficiency in English and U.S. civics, they could apply for citizenship. Dreamers, those here under temporary protective status, and certain farm workers could apply for a green card without waiting the five years, although all the other requirements would apply. There is another exception. Long-term residents recently deported could also apply and might be granted an exception for family unity and other humanitarian reasons. There are many important parts of this proposed legislation, but as the debate on the bill begins, could we please start with an agreement on the need to pass this core provision of a path to citizenship? El Minuto de Libertades Civiles es posible gracias a ACLU, porque la libertad no puede defenderse a sí misma. In corporate speak, there are no, quote, job cuts. Instead, firings are blandly referred to as employment adjustments. Now, though, corporate wordsmiths will need a whole new thesaurus of euphemisms, for masses of job cuts are coming for employees in the higher echelons of the corporate structure. Don't look now, but an unanticipated result of the ongoing pandemic is that it has given cover for CEOs to speed up the adoption of highly advanced RPAs, robotic process automation, to replace employees once assumed to be immune from displacement. As one analyst told a New York Times reporter, with RPA, you can build a bot that costs $10,000 a year and take out two to four humans. Prior to the COVID crisis, many top executives feared a public backlash if they pushed automation too far too fast. But ironically, the economic collapse caused by the pandemic has so discombobulated the workplace and diverted public attention that corporate bosses have been emboldened to rush ahead. While the nationwide shutdown of offices and furloughing of employees has caused misery for millions, one happy purveyor of RPA systems notes that it has, quote, massively raised awareness among executives about the variety of work that no longer requires human involvement. He cheerfully declares, we think any business process can be automated, advising corporate bosses that half to two-thirds of all the tasks being done at their companies can be done by machines. This is Jim Hightower saying, Conventional corporate wisdom blithely preaches that all new technologies create more jobs than they kill. But even these Pollyannish preachers are now conceding that this robotic automation of white-collar jobs is being imposed so widely, suddenly, and stealthily that losses will crush any gains. The Hightower Radio Lowdown is brought to you by the Lowdown Happy Hour, now live streaming on Facebook from the Chat and Chew Cafe. So grab a libation, pull up a virtual chair, and join our freewheeling conversations with political mavericks, musical agitators, and kick-ass grassroots groups. The Lowdown Happy Hour will connect you to good trouble activists who are building people power across America. Get the Lowdown at HightowerLowdown.org. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1947. That was the day Centralia Coal Mine No. 5 exploded, killing 111 miners in Centralia, Illinois. The explosion occurred just as the day shift was ending. Those not killed instantly were trapped and died from their burns or the after damp. Words scrawled on the wall of the mine read, Look in our pockets. We all have notes. Please give them to our wives. State inspectors had been forewarning mine owners about the dangers of accumulated combustible coal dust for years before the explosion, but were ignored. Illinois mine inspector Driscoll Scanlon had been filing reports since 1942 about deteriorating conditions. 
the demand for coal during wartime had increased production at the expense of safety. In the aftermath of the explosion, John L. Lewis, president of the United Mine Workers of America, called a work stoppage in memory of the dead miners. He also held Secretary of the Interior Julius Krug guilty of criminal negligence. Lewis accused Krug of having failed to enforce existing mine regulations. In response, Krug ordered that 518 mines remain closed for inspection. The House and Senate proceeded to organize hearings on mine safety. They demanded that the Bureau of Mines continue to pass inspection findings on to the proper state agencies. Given the power mine owners had at the state level, these instructions ensured no improvements in mine safety would occur. It would be another 22 years before any real change occurred at the federal level. It happened an hour ago, way down in this tunnel of coal. The gas caught fire from somebody's lamp and the miners are choking in smoke. Labor History on 2 brought to you by Biggie the Illinois Labor honey. History Society and the Goodbye Rick Smith Show. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Expecting highs only around uh, 48 to 50 degrees today, a bit cooler than yesterday. Winds will be out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And uh, cloudy skies throughout the day. We did have a, a uh, forecast for rain in this afternoon, but it looks like they've taken that off. We're only supposed to be getting partly cloudy skies tonight with lows near the mid-30s with winds out of the north at 5 to 10 miles per hour. And then partly cloudy skies tomorrow, Friday, with highs in the low 60s. Winds light and variable. Confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon now stand at 9,033, and the deceased confirmed stands at 120. That has been unchanged since last week. Pollen is still rated as none here uh, by the weather underground in Rogue River proper, but I got to tell you, there's pollen out there. The air quality index, though, is good for the region at 34 parts per million, and the daytime UV index remains moderate at 5. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 29.97 inches, visibility is at 7 miles, and relative humidity is at 96%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. London is 53 and partly cloudy. Paris is 56 and cloudy. Rome is 61 and sunny. Oh, Rome in the spring. It's sunny. Kiev is 44 and fair. Kabul is 58 and partly cloudy. Hong Kong is 67 and clear. Tokyo is 55 and partly cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 67 and clear. San Francisco, California is 47 and partly cloudy with a small craft wind advisory on the bay and offshore. Do take care. And New York, New York is 55 degrees Fahrenheit with heavy fog. So look out. And that is... Weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that are crowd crowdsources from around the world. I 
Elizabeth Killiford and Raphael Sater of Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Facebook Inc. said yesterday, Wednesday, it had blocked a group of hackers in China who used the platform to target Uyghurs leave, living abroad with links to malware that would infect their devices and enable surveillance. The social media company said the hackers, known as Earth Ampusa, or Evil Eye in the security industry, targeted activists, journalists, and dissidents who were predominantly Uyghurs, a largely Muslim ethnic group facing persecution in China. Facebook said there were less than 500 targets who were largely from the Xinjiang region but were primarily living abroad in countries including Turkey, Kazakhstan, the U.S., Syria, Australia, and Canada, eh? It said the majority of the hackers' activity occurred away from Facebook and that they used the site to share links to malicious websites rather than directly sharing the malware on the platform. This activity had the hallmarks of a well-resourced and persistent operation while obfuscating who's behind it, Facebook cybersecurity investigators said in a blog post. I can read it, but can I say it? Facebook said the hacking group used fake Facebook accounts to pose as fictitious journalists, students, human rights advocates, or members of the Uyghur community to build trust with their targets and trick them into clicking malicious links that would install the spying software on their devices. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est doux Stephanie Nebehe of Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook of Speakeasy. The UN Human Rights Office said yesterday, Wednesday, it confirmed the accuracy of published remarks by the independent expert who led an investigation into the murder of Jamal Khashoggi, alleging that a senior Saudi official had made a threat against her. The Guardian newspaper on Tuesday quoted Agnes Calamard, UN expert on summary killings, as saying the Saudi official had threatened that she would be, quote, taken care of. End quote, if she was not reined in following her investigation into the journalist's murder. Saudi officials did not respond to a request for comment. Calamar did not respond when contacted by Reuters. We confirm that the details in the Guardian story about the threat aimed at Agnes Calamar are accurate. UN Human Rights Spokesman Rupert Colville said in an email reply to Reuters. The human, UN Human Rights Office had informed Calamard about the threat as well as UN security and authorities, he said. Calamard told The Guardian the threat was conveyed in a January 2020 meeting between Saudi and UN officials in Geneva. She said she was told of the incident by a UN colleague. Calamard led a U.N. investigation into the October 2018 killing of Khashoggi by Saudi agents in the kingdom's Istanbul consulate. She issued a report in 2019 concluding there was credible evidence that Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman and senior Saudi officials were responsible for the killing of the Washington Post journalist who was a U.S. resident. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio will broadcast on. And we're going to meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. Because we are all Nighthawks in the Diner of Life, after all. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night. 
for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Dans mon jardin d'hiver